And are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Hi. So it's, hey. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Ina Petkova from Darkness, and she's going to tell us about a conduct invariant from border pigard floor homage. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. And sorry I couldn't make it in person. So and we just wrapped teaching. So I'm barely making it from one room to the other. <laughs> That's the state of fatigue right now. Um, all right, so I just kind of started giggling at myself. At some point in grad school, I just said, I can't sit for another contact topology talk that starts with the definition of a contact structure. <laughs> and I just realized this is how I'm starting, but well, that's life. So um, you can talk about a joint project with Akram, uh, as well as with uh, Vicky Folvari, Kristen Hendricks, John Likara, and Vera Vertishin. Um, and the general idea is, OK, we want to study contact structures on three manifolds. And a few of us come from the Hager floor theory world more so than the contact topology world. So this is going to be maybe more of a Hager floor talk. I don't know. Um, but so, okay, just uh, to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, even though uh, maybe unnecessary at UGA, but um, we have a three manifold, what's a contact structure on it. It's a totally non-integrable two plane field. So it's just imagine a plane in every um, tangent space over every point of the manifold. Or you could think of that as the kernel of a one form alpha so that alpha wedge d alpha is everywhere non-zero um and sorry in advance but uh for some reason my screen sharing is not updating all the time so i'm gonna be flicking back and forth so that i can use my highlighter whenever i'm not seeing it work okay so just an example to the side or kind of a local picture of you know you have a point and you have these planes that are kind of tilting up and non-integrable just kind of means you Nowhere can you see it uh, locally as the tangent space to a submanifold to a surface. And so a three manifold with a contact structure that's called the contact manifold. And um, I want to understand these. Okay. So um, I guess the talk is going to be about things with boundary, but uh, there's a lot to visualize, and uh, border floor homology is a fairly technical field. So um, at the risk of kind of spending a long time talking about something that maybe a lot of uh, the audience has already seen, I still think that's the safer approach that, than to try to jump directly to stuff with boundary. And so I'm backtracking almost 20 years at this point to an invariant for closed three manifolds. Um, defined by Auschwitz and Sabo originally. So before we even put a contact structure on something, what is Hager floor homology? It's a construction that starting with a three manifold, if we present it a certain way, if we look at a Hager splitting for it, we could write a Hager diagram. So what is that? Um, I have a Hager splitting into two handle bodies and I can look at um, their intersection. So it's a Hager surface and I could record a set of uh, compressing, well, boundaries of compression disks, uh, one set for each of the two handle bodies, maybe color code them as red and blue. So that's a Hager surface. Um, and if I do things carefully enough and impose a few additional choices, I can uh, run a floor construction on this Hager diagram to get myself a chain complex. So the original construction, how does it go? Well, you have a Hager surface of genus G and you're gonna look at the default symmetric product. So it's a two G manifold, complex manifold. And uh, you can look at the lifts of um, these circles that, um, that bound compressing disks and you get G-dimensional G tori. And you could study, uh, you could look at the Lagrangian floor theory of these two tori. And so you get a chain complex whose homology is an invariant of the three manifold. And that's known as Hager floor homology. Okay. So just topology so far. But if you're a bit careful, 
And if you adapt this construction in a certain way, you can actually see a contact structure. And I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. And so suppose in addition, you're given a contact structure on your three manifold, you can take care to construct your Hager diagram in a special way so that that contact structure is being read. And you could get yourself a homology class, uh, let's call it CFC in, well, that's how they originally constructed everything. They constructed it in the Hager floor homology of negative M. But so you get a homology class that tells you uh, various things. Okay, so that was done very soon after, um, after Hager floor homology was defined. And I'm cite citing um, two sets of names here. So the very first appearance of this definition was by Oshvat and Sabo. Um, the way they did it is, I uh, suppose, I guess it was just a bit, to, to me, it's a bit more technical and non-intuitive, but um, um, suppose you have an open book decomposition of, well, suppose you have a knot in your three manifold that you can think of as the binding of an open book and it induces a filtration on the Hager floor homology. And from there you get somehow this class. But a couple of years later, Honda Kazes and Matic um, redefined this invariant in a much more um, computationally, visually, topologically appealing to, to many way. Um, and that's the definition I'm actually gonna focus on. I, I find it uh, much easier to understand. So uh, before we even go to how this is defined, what are properties of this class in Hager floor homology? Suppose your contact structure is over twisted and um, I don't know, it's just kind of hard to take a poll here because some of you are in the room, but um, just speed me up or backtrack me if I'm saying things that are too familiar or too unfamiliar, I guess. Uh, but an over-twisted contact structure is um, you could find the disk in your three manifolds so that the structure looks a certain way um, on it. Maybe one good way to think about it is you can find the disk in your three manifold so that your contact planes are everywhere tangent to the boundary of the disk. That's one way to say it. Um, over twisted structures imply that the contact class vanishes. Um, in, well, so structures that are not over twisted are called tight. And certain tight structures um, are Stein fillable. So you could see them as the boundary of a certain, of a Stein four manifold. And uh, this would imply that the contact class in Hager floor homology is actually non-zero. Okay, so we can use it to obstruct. Um, another property that was kind of proven in the first few years after this definition was suppose your contact structure has um, Giroud torsion which is you have a torus, a thickened torus in your, in your manifold with a certain contact structure on it um, that you can sort of think of as, um, you, you could think of the contact planes as inducing a certain foliation of by parallel lines on the torus. And as you push into the thickening in the I direction, they each rotate a little bit. Uh, and so as they have a, as they make a full turn each, um, you get what I would call, I guess, a one torsion or a two pi torsion is usually how you would see it. And so if you have that, you get contact class zero. Maybe um, this, just a little diagram of uh, the world of contact structures. Uh, so, all right, over twisted structures, um, always you can, you can find your root torsion. So the class of, um, Contact structures that do have Giroud torsion is a little bigger than all the twisted ones. And as I mentioned, fillable ones, you can think of as a subset of tight ones. And so tight contact structures, so outside of the red set are the ones that are a bit more interesting to understand. Okay. Um, cool. So just some maybe open questions, or there might be some recent activity in this direction, by the way. Um, so if anyone knows, let me know. But it's not quite clear when exactly um, would that contact class vanish. For example, suppose you have a separating one half Giroud torsion. So you have a thickened separating torus 
and you can see the contact planes making the half a turn there. Um, does that imply the contact class is zero? Yes or no? Is there a counterexample? Um, just a little more advertising before we go into definitions is well, why is this class exciting? I mean, it was used to prove other things. It was used to do other stuff in low dimensional topology. So to prove that a uh, not floor homology detects the genus, detects fiberness, stuff like that. Secretly, the construction is in the heart of those proofs. Um, so I'm about to get to defining it. Any questions maybe for now? So feel free to pause me at any point. Okay, so the definition I'm gonna give is my favorite one. This is the Honda Kazes Maltic version. And so the construction uses the notion of open book decompositions. So what's an open book decomposition? First, uh, forget about contact structures. I have a three manifold. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at um, a link in it, which we're gonna call the binding. And I'm going to write my three manifold is the union of surfaces um, called pages, so that all they share in common is their boundary. And so schematically, the picture looks like um, this exactly open book sort of uh, schematics to the right. All right, so how you can think of it is M minus the binding. You can fiber it. You can look at an S1. You have an S1 fibration on it. So that the preimage of any uh, time on the circle is a surface called a page like that, okay? And the boundary of each page is the binding. Um, so how can I also think of it? I could think of my three manifold then as a product, surface cross, not S1 yet, but uh, just the thickened surface. And then I can quotient by glue the very last to the very first surface via some diffeomorphism um, and also make sure to compress the boundary. So, you know, that too becomes just compresses to the binding, okay? All right. So um, back to contact structures then, and my, I'm not sinking once again. Uh, back to contact structures. So what does it mean for an open book to be compatible with a contact structure? Uh, vaguely, well, you could just write it mathematically best as um, alpha is positive on the binding. That is uh, the one form that you could uh, use to write C as the kernel of it. And the alpha is positive on the pages. You could approximately think as the contact planes are um, transverse to the binding. And as you pull away from the binding into a page, they become parallel, more and more, or, um, right, yeah. Okay. So, great. And we have this, um, should I call it alleged Jura theorem? What's, what's the trend these days to call it? Well, we have this correspondence that, um, contact structures up to um, isotopy, they correspond with open books um, up to isotopy of the open book and up to stabilization. So stabilization is a well understood operation of just adding genes to your surface in a trivial way. Any questions? The next thing we're gonna do is uh, start building a Hadley diagram. Just so there, more, you're not going yeah. too slow. You know, you're not going too slow. I am not going too slow. Yeah, I, since I know you were worried about that. Do you want me to go too slow? No, no, you're doing fine. You're just, uh... I could also go too slow. Okay, uh, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I do that when I teach sometimes. I just kind of ask for a speedometer of like, thumb up is really fast and thumb down is really slow. And then just kind of dial it and try to tell me how fast you think I'm going. It's kind of fun to read these on Zoom. Um, all right, so back again, just because we took a long break. Uh, so this is our open book and we're gonna build a Hager surface from it. <clears throat> so we're gonna build a Hager decomposition of the three manifold. Okay, so again, just a 
review preview of what we said a few minutes ago. Now we have a contact three manifold. We're gonna we know what it means to have an open book for it that's compatible with the contact structure. Now from an open book, we're gonna have to describe how to get a Hager diagram. Further, we're gonna have to identify a special element on that Hager diagram um, that gives us a homology class. Okay. <clears throat> and um well, especially since uh, Gordon is here, apologies for not spelling out names fully. Um, it just has become such a, that has become a word, Gordana. HKM is a word now. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a name. I was saying it, but I was, I realized I was muted. So. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Just keep going. <laughs> Just keep going. Okay, so um, here's a little bit of a color-coded Hager splitting. Um, all right, so this is our open book. If you think what's really happening at any given moment in time, well, you have that surface and um, it unfolds through time. we we'll kind of keep its boundary. Uh, maybe this is the surface cross an interval of time, except at the boundary, it's really compressed, it's quotient to nothing. But what is a thickened surface with boundary? It's really a handle body, isn't it? So um, I guess, you know, going half the way, I have a handle body and coming back the other half the way, I got a handle body and that's just how it is. Um, but if I wanna be a little more careful, how could I build a Hager surface out of that? Well, um, let's take, a page at time zero maybe, and a page at time pi, and take their union, that should be this Hager surface. How can I find compressing disks now? Well, um, schematically I have a surface and um, with boundary. And so if I find a set of curves that cut it into a polygon, then when I unfold pi units of time, when I thicken cross I, um, those curves are tracking disks and cutting the handle body along those disks, I'm left with a three ball, right? Because polygon cross zero to pi is a, is a three ball. Um, if you don't believe me, it's one of those things that you try to over visualize it and you're only doing yourself uh, an unfavor, but um, you also can't help it, can you? It's just how it works. Um, okay. So maybe this is a better schematic than just look at the open book from above. And so you have, you have chopped up your surface into uh, a polygon along a bunch of curves. And as you track those curves through time, they form your compressing disks. Well, if you think about what happened though, um, you have the curve at time zero and you have the image of it on the other side of that disk. See, like we said that we're gonna compress the boundary in the time direction to just this one binding. Um, and so a curve union, its image uh, pi units of time later, adds up to a complete circle, which is the boundary of your compressing disks, a disk. Um, and you could do the same game on the other side, right? Um, take cutting arcs for the surface at time pi, take their copies as you go pi units of time on the surface S2 pi. And that's the boundary of the blue compressing disks. Except of course, uh, we gotta be careful how we draw this because the surface at time two pi, uh, you have this monodromy that glues it to the surface at time zero. So if you wanna see all your curves all on the same surface, um, you're gonna have to follow the images of the blue ones here with um, whatever gluing diffeomorphism you got. Okay, let's just um, let's just see this written out a little better. Um, David, am I still not going too slow or too fast? Or you're gonna be my gauge. Good. I don't know. Doesn't mean too fast. Good. All right. If I get anyone angry or frustrated, just shout at me. Um, and uh, let's have a three-dimensional picture. Um, like that. So binding is color coded sort of purple or one of those colors, pinkish purple everywhere. And so suppose that this is my surface at time pi and the right hand side is my surface at time zero. Now we're taking two copies, right? Just be careful with orientations, but 
Um, like we said, I have here these two cutting arcs. And so as I unfold pi units of time, they form my compressing disks. And so I'll take their images on the other page. And these two highlighted circles um, tell me how on the one side of the Hagrid surface I can build my three manifold. Okay, well, um, that page hasn't changed whatsoever when I hit time pi. So I could build the blue circles by just taking copies of the reds, um, push them off a little bit and take copies of them. And as we pointed out, I'm gonna have to follow with, um, apply my diffeomorphism H to them on the other side. Um, so I never said what Hager floor homology is. So if, um, if you're someone in the audience who's never seen it, let me just tell you again, I said it's sort of a Lagrangian floor theory where you just look at these um, G-dimensional tori of red and blue and their intersection points. That means their intersection points are the generators of a chain complex and um, curves between them uh, are what's recorded by the differential. Now, visually on a Hager surface, you could think of a generator of your um, Hager floor chain complex you can think of a generator as a tuple of intersection points between red and blue, so that there's exactly one point on every red curve and exactly one point on every blue curve. So the two I've highlighted now as a pair give you one generator of that chain complex. Um, just take it as a given and let's flow with that. No pun intended. Um, well, okay. Now, this specific construction gives me a very special generator. Um, I've like kind of been lazy here and not really built my diagram fully, but one special generator that I can immediately see um, as I have, I don't know, depending on the genus and how many boundary components your surface has, you have a bunch of these curves and you have these reds on the S pi copy of your surface and you have their push-offs in blue that you, you're just grabbing the red and you're perturbing along, um, I guess the positive direction of the boundary of S pi. And so you get a twin of it and they um, each twin intersects its um, originator, the original curve in one unique point. And so I'll take that, um, that tuple of points and that gives you a very special generator. So this X here. And this very special generator of your chain complex is who turns out to be the, its homology class is the contact class of the contact structure. Okay. So I think it's just really cool that you could, it's just so easy to see and then it takes a lot of work to show that it does what it does and so on, but um, that's your class. Um, okay, so I haven't really said what the differential counts and all that stuff, but we could black box a bunch and just uh, see what can we do with that stuff or which ways can we generalize this kind of construction. Any questions so far? Okay, so we got some visual how we can build something. We have a bunch of black boxed of the technicalities, but we also have a bunch of properties that we saw. So we could believe that if we understand that stuff really well, well, it's useful. Uh, just really to strip away the details, that's what I have left uh, so far. Okay. Um, and so the goal of the rest of today is to explain how we could get an analog of this construction, but for uh, manifold with boundary. Now, that already existed so soon after, I haven't written this up, I don't have a slide for it, but um, Honda Kuzes and Matic again, soon after the closed construction um, defined a class in the sutured floor homology of a manifold with boundary. So that's something like Hager floor homology, but for things with boundary. Um, and so this already existed. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is a bit of a different creature. So I'm going to look at a class in the bordered Hager floor homology of a manifold with boundary. 
Um, and so I'm going to need a bit more structure on my three manifold. I'm going to say what this is, or I'm going to say what this is in a moment. Um, and yeah, OK, so the trade off is you need to understand a bit more structure. The kind of algebraic objects you get are a bit more messy. Uh, but the advantage that comes with that is that you have a very well behaved um, gluing formula that takes the form of some algebraic tensor product. So it gives you a cut and paste way to decompose your contact class into chunks, roughly. OK. Um, OK, so what's the rough idea? What is bordered Hager floor homology? So um, this is. Um, this is how Vera Verta, she draws a three manifold. She, she does a potato, she calls it a potato. So let's try to be a little less concrete now. And so again, M was a three manifold and we said U and V are gonna be two handle bodies. So I can write any three manifold as the union of two handle bodies um, along their boundary surface. And um, there's a lot of stuff just happened all at once, but just kind of think of cutting your three manifold along a separating surface that the trans across in a way. So each of the two handle bodies is chopped up into something with corners. And um, I guess maybe your Hager surface, if it was a little less schematic, was chopped up into two surfaces with boundary. Just, I guess to, to motivate the picture, suppose you have a cut like that. Um, well, if you cut a three manifold along a surface and you want to keep very good track of how to re-glue, you really need to parameterize that surface, identify all the curves on it, that what goes on the left, what goes on the right. So uh, what you get is a border three manifold. So it's a three manifold with boundary and that boundary is carefully parameterized so that you know how you can glue two things together. Um, and what's half of a Hager splitting? It's called a bordered Hager splitting. So we get these uh, bordered Hager decompositions that visually just think of wiping out half of the pictures that I had before. Um, and so um, oh, let me just put some names here. So this is um, a construction due to Lipschitz, Oshvat, and Thurston from around. Oh, Anywhere from 06 to 09, you wouldn't be wrong if you say it that way. Let's call it 06 ish. Nah, 08. Just make it really fuzzy so no one can read the year. Um, oh, good, it's not sinking anyway. All right. And so to a bordered splitting of a three manifold with boundary, they associate an A infinity module. Um, over the, an algebra which is associated to, so a differential algebra, a graded algebra is associated to uh, the boundary surface of the three manifold. Okay, so think approximately, if you don't like hearing the word A infinity, think that you have roughly something like differential graded modules over a differential graded algebra. And so gluing on the topological level corresponds to taken a uh, derived tensor product on the algebraic level in a way that it recovers the Hager floor homology of your three manifold. Okay. Um, not gonna define much of anything at all. Um, but just kind of start building topologically Hager diagrams and jump to contact things if that's okay. Okay, so the takeaway from this kind of schematic chop chop kind of picture is that things with boundary have, uh, there's an analogous construction uh, of a Hager floor type invariant. So the gluing corresponds to taking a tensor product and you can study pieces of things and you can recover um, data by taking a tensor product. So, okay. No, yeah. Uh so uh, on the last slide, the separating surface is 
Can you give me some intuition for what conditions it needs to satisfy? Is? Does it just need to be transverse to the boundary or? Um, that might be just fine to think about it this way for now. So to build a decent looking Hager diagram, what's gonna happen is that it's gonna be um, intersecting the one handle body in, so, right, all right, so we sort of have that Hager surface here. It's gonna conveniently intersect the one side of the handle body in like a disc, and it's gonna just have genus on the other side so that you can sort of see it. If you see chomping up a Hager surface, you would only see the one color of the arcs being cut up. Um, but I'm being very vague, just sort of for, for the sake of time. But yeah, there are conditions. Think of it as transverse. That's a good place to start. And think of it, if you wanna just chop up a picture rather than see it geometrically, think of I'm chopping up my Hager diagram so that, um, so that at the end, the border Hager di diagram I might see has curves that roughly kind of look like, oh, I don't know, like this, but maybe only the red ones are allowed to touch the boundary and only in certain ways. Um, I'm being quite vague, but is that fine? We could chat later more about this. Sure, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, it, is a, it is a good question. So um, now, what are we gonna do? Um, right, we used to have a manifold uh, with a contact structure and we wanna present it by an open book to get a Hager diagram and to get a contact invariant out of that. Now, um, and just so I can state a glowing result simultaneously, um, let's just say that I have something with boundary and um, let's even suppose you cut it into a left and a right piece. So M sub L, C sub L, imagine that's a pair of uh, contact three manifold with boundary and um, oh boy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have <clears throat> more requirements. So that boundary has to be kind of well behaved with respect to the contact structure. So let's say that it's gonna be convex, but um, bear with me if um, you're deeper into that field, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a lot more specific in another five minutes. So for now, just say something with boundary. What we're gonna present it by is something um, called a foliated open book. So it's an open book for an object with boundary that's gonna have a lot of, maybe a little too much, but a lot of data on the boundary of itself. Um, and if we do this well, we're gonna get us a bordered Hager diagram. It's really a bordered sutured Hager diagram which is a variation of um, what I mentioned on the previous slide uh, introduced by Ruman Zarev. So I'm getting a stylus malfunction, but um, okay. Um, in any case, you're gonna extract from that classes in the A infinity bi modules for the border diagrams so that, just so I can state something of a result here, so that their tensor product recovers the contact class for the union of your, um, my highlighter is not working again. So that their tensor product recovers the contact class um, for the closed manifold that you get by taking the union of the, the two bordered ones. Okay, so that's kind of the preview of what we wanna build. Um, all right. So, you know, this last fact that the tensor product recovers things, that's, that's you guys theorem or that's kind of like obvious once it's all set up? Um, hmm. It's not. Which way do you want to say it is, Akram? I mean, I don't know. Isn't everything obvious after you prove it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, but I think it's uh, best to say that it's a theorem because um, the way you build that stuff, it was actually a little painful for us to even understand properly what it means to glue things together in a way that's compatible with how the pages of the open book even flow together. So even topologically, we went through a ton of headaches to, to be able to comprehend how things get glued up. 
So I think it's a big theorem with a big THM in front of it of how, how much uh, it got us sweating. But in a sense, anyway. once you understand topologically what's going on, it, it does eventually come to you as a given. Yeah. Thanks. It's obvious, man. Um, yeah, okay. So a um, little bit of, um, okay, what did I say? I said that I'm gonna need to use something called a foliated open book. So let's get to it. What is that? Uh, foliated open book. Approximately think of it as it's an open book for something with a uh, boundary. So just like a closed manifold is you have a surface revolving through time with a fixed part of it that doesn't move that eventually closes off to produce the whole thing. Now think of you have the same thing, but um, so here's a really silly one. Here's a surface. So here's uh, one manifold, not a link anymore, but just an interval called the binding. And what if my surface is just half of a disc and I spin it through time and it's gonna make a three ball. I think it's just a simpler picture than anything else I've drawn uh, at the moment on this uh, board. All right, fair enough. So this time I have a surface, but not all of its boundary is uh, being compressed and steady. So I'm allowing this to move around and it traces like a complete three ball, right? I'm gonna do stuff like that. Okay, so um, a little more elaborate example coming up in a moment. So my binding this time is gonna be just a one manifold in the three manifold, but it may have boundary. Um, still gonna have an S1 function. So I'm still gonna fiber in a circle direction. Um, but I'm gonna now have to impose a bunch of conditions. So just bear with me. And if some of them make sense and others just kind of stay a bit question marked, that's fine. Okay. So I'm gonna use tilde to denote my um, S1 valued function restricted to the boundary of the three manifold. And um, so this topological idea construction was developed um, by John Licata and Vera Vertici. Um, and that's what allowed us to take it on from there and build what we're about to define. Okay. The pages, like the example is this half disk that I had, um, I'm still gonna call them pages are gonna be the preimage of any time T, right? Um, but they're allowed to have part of their boundary on what we call the binding, but they're also allowed to have other parts of the boundary, right? This is this pi tilde inverse of some time component. And this is S sub T the page. So I can look like that. So they can have corners. Um, and my surface is allowed to change as it evolves through time. It's allowed to topologically change little by little. Okay, So it's not the same surface all the time. Um, So what about this Morse function? I'm gonna want it to um, have a unique critical point for each critical value. So I don't want more than one thing at a time to be happening. I'm gonna have that surface page revolving through, evolving really through time. And I don't want more than one thing at a time to be changing, okay? Um, I'm gonna want the level sets of my, uh, S1 valued function restricted to the boundary to not have um, circles. And so, you know, if, if I look at the, so here was my ball. That was the binding and here was one page. So if I just look at um, the portions of the pages that are just on the boundary of the manifold, I get to foliate that boundary, right? Okay. And so that's why they're called foliated open books because secretly I'm gonna keep track of how this boundary is foliated, the boundary of M. Um, here's a slightly more exciting example. Suppose you have, um, it's still a three ball, but it's skewered a little different on, I'm gonna see it embedded into R3 as you see it sitting right now. And it's skewered on this um, Z axis. So now your binding is two intervals 
in, um, John calls it a telephone, but I call it a peanut. So if you see what happens at any given moment in time, as you come out of the page, you see these half disks, yeah? And as you start revolving to the right, well, they still kind of look like half disks, but little by little, they get kind of bigger until you hit a critical point of the boundary. You see, they're eventually gonna touch these two half disks. And so you get a hyperbolic point of your foliation on the boundary of the surface. Um, okay. And what happens when you pass that critical stage where uh, the page doesn't really look like a surface, right? As you pass through that special moment in time, what does the page look like? Right, just behind that. Well, I don't know, there it is. Does that seem believable? So I've dipped deep into the peanut to the right. Okay, so my page changed from two half disks to sort of like a rectangle. Um, I could think of that as a sad cobordism that just happened, right? I joined the two half disks with a band. Um, so this is the kind of object we study and we find a way to build a Hager diagram for it that does the right stuff. Um, let me just pause. So for now, some of it might look a little kind of technical or heavy or too much, and that's okay. Um, if so, just take it as a picture and maybe try to understand what do I see here. All right, I see the skewered peanut. Um, and just try to, to see how it evolves through time and your the topological type of your pages changes, right? Still think of it as an open book kind of construction, right? Um, and that's just fine, but uh, you're still welcome to ask any questions if you have so far. Yeah, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. um, so like, what's, what's the reason for allowing the pages to change topologically? Like, is it just like it would be too boring if you didn't? Well, so because if they don't, there's only so much stuff you can build, right? Now you want to be able to build anything imaginable that's a three manifold width boundary. Um, and so how is that boundary, um, how is that boundary gonna have any kind of exciting topological type unless things are changing, right? So I challenge you to think, well, can you make me, I don't know, can you make me a solid torus as something that fibers like that, but so that the pages never change, it's just gonna, not gonna work out really, right? So is that all right? It just, this is what you need in order to construct, in order to decompose any space imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Good question. Okay. Um, so what does it mean to be compatible with your contact structure? Same as usual. Um, alpha is positive on the binding, the alpha is positive on the pages. Um, and now we said that the time induces a foliation on the boundary. So here on this ball, the foliation kind of looks like what I'm highlighting right now. Um, so a singular foliation you get there just induced by the time, um, okay, by intersecting the boundary of M with the pages. Uh, we're going to want that to agree with the characteristic foliation um, induced by the contact structure. Okay. And when I'm saying agrees with, um, oops, quotation mark. When I'm saying agrees with, I mean, um, so bear with me if this is just something you haven't had to deal with, but um, you can find the dividing set for each of these, the one coming from the um, open book and the one from the contact structure, you can find a common dividing set and you can find an isotopy taking one foliation to the other, but it fixes the, um, the dividing set gamma. 
So it could be that your characteristic foliation kind of spins around or whatever it does, but at the end, um, you can isotope it to the one given by uh, the open book decomposition. Sorry, can you repeat that again, what you said? Um, maybe I'll just like um, highlight this box. So you have the time foliation, which kind of in this embedded thing looks like mm -hmm. intersection with the straight pages. On the other hand, so think of this, this is compatible with a standard rotational uh, tight contact structure. So I really suck at visualizing this, but you know, the characteristic one is gonna look a little twisty, a little different, um, but you okay. should be able to find a dividing set on this ball. So that it's the same exact dividing point wise for each of them. I see. So, so you're, you're assuming that there is, you're assuming the foliation is such that it had, that they, yeah. that the two things have a common dividing set. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, right. that, that's a part a, of compatibility. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I missed that. Okay. Thanks. Great. Great. So that's part of the definition that otherwise. It's, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. That was a really good, uh, that was an important clarification. So, okay, I mean, we're close to out of time and this is just a lot of uh, visually kind of challenging stuff to deal with. So maybe let's fast forward to a little bit of, just so we can formulate something. So I just want to rehash again that, uh, what did we say? Our pages change, right? The topology changes in this case with a peanut, well, think of maybe starting where time is, we're facing straight to the right. The page is on the page of my tablet. Um, and so this is the time direction. So I have to look through the back of the tablet to see the page. So this is what I've drawn here. Okay. This says zero is just, this says zero. And as I move a little further to the back, eventually I have a cut cobordism and I only see two half disks. So things evolve. Um, how am I gonna build a Hager diagram out of it? Um, I can't fully describe that in the remaining, I don't even know, is this a 50 or a 60 minute talk? Typically. 60. Could 60. be 60. Uh, I'm gonna start negotiating now. Um, <laughs> 70? <laughs> no, 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 we'll keep it civilized. So, um, all right, as my surface evolves through time, I mean, what is it really? I could just only do one critical thing at a time. That was part of the deal, right? And so I could think of it as a sequence of cut and cutting cobordisms and addition cobordisms. This drives me nuts, this highlighter. Okay, and so I think of it as a sequence of these until eventually I come back home. Um, and as always, I might have to come back home by identifying that final page with the first one by some diffeomorphism. And I can record all that information, but it's not always gonna let me build a Hager diagram. So just bear with me a little longer. All right, but yeah, I have a page and I cut it to get two half disks and I could record that kind of drawn it for a technical reason, a little funky, but I mean, all right, I could cut here along this arc. So that could be a cutting arc for my cobordism that eventually gives me two half disks. And, um, Later in time, these half disks are gonna try to come closer together, but I'm just gonna take one representative page, this so-called S sub one, where the topology never changed and just jump straight to when after past that critical point, I added something, right? And so um, can't really draw it here, but maybe I could think of it as an arc on the resulting page so that if I cut along it, I would get the preceding page. So you could here and there sprinkle decorations that tell you how your surface evolved. Um, okay. And now I still don't know. I mean, in general, you have things kind of get more complicated or more simplified as you go around the circle, um, circle worth of times. And you don't necessarily get that uh, you can split time into two halves in a way that gives you handle bodies. So there's more work to do at the moment for the next seven minutes. 
So I'm going to have to ask myself, what does it take to be able to build handle bodies? Um, let's see. So as I add stuff, so I've color coded that with a darker blue, I'm going to draw the co-core of the added handle on the resulting surface. And um, as things continue to happen, I'm going to keep copy pasting that data later on. Um, if by evolving through time, at some point I cut my surface, I'm going to draw that cutting arc. And I'm going to keep drawing it on the preceding surfaces, right? I could keep track of where it was from before I cut. And potentially a few copies earlier, maybe just a bunch of chopped up chunks of arc, right? Because other stuff was happening. But, but I'm going to want to draw these guys like that. Okay, once I've added, keep track of where I added for the rest of time. Uh, once I've cut, keep track of where I had cut all the way back to the beginning of time. Okay. And here comes the technical condition that guarantees that you can always find a way to represent that by a bordered Hager diagram, by a diagram that somehow um, how you parameterize the boundary of the three manifold is reading off the foliation on that boundary. Okay, so this is the technical condition and um, just bear with me and let's breeze through it and just take it as a given because this really does take a long time to, to digest. Um, it did for us as well. It's just something you need to stare at patiently for a while uh, at complete pictures maybe. But the technical condition is that our foliated open books will be uh, what, um, what's called sorted. So you somehow want them to be so that these addition and cutting arcs are so nicely organized that you can draw representatives of them so that on any given page, I'm not gonna say S sub TI, but I'm just gonna say SI, whatever representative of the page type. You, you see these, um, let's see, plus, I'm gonna write a plus when I'm cutting, too bad. Um, the arcs where you're cutting, you can see them all disjoint on each surface, on each surface that I told you you're forced to draw them. And the arcs where you're gonna be adding, um, right? So I added and then those uh, co-cores continue to be drawn on any later surface. I can see all of that stuff disjoint on every page that I re requested from you to draw it on. And I can also see them kind of organized by indices in a certain way. As I track through the boundary of the manifold intersect the page, I want to see them indexed. So, uh, you know, I see them from one singular elliptic point, a point on the binding to another. And as I see in what order I see them, I could predict or I could read off in what order my cuts and additions happened. This is, I'm just kind of, smearing what I've written here. If that's the case, that means that you can evolve your page through time. If you can do that, you can make all these addition and uh, deletion of handles cordisms happen disjointly without running into each other. And then you would be able to draw a Hager diagram. Okay. Um, so it's obnoxiously technical and it takes a lot of being able to see or believe stuff, but all we maybe want to take away at the moment is, is that I can always make this happen. And the cost of- Can I ahead. ask a question? Yeah. So, uh, so you are starting from a three manifold with boundary mm -hmm. and you're saying you can find the Morse function that does this or- I mean, what's, the, saying, what's the statement actually? So I'm saying that if your three manifold with boundary um, has a contact, a contact on it and the boundary yeah. is convex, yeah. um, you can, well, first of all, you can always find a foliated open book for that. Yeah. That's just fine. Okay. Right. But at the cost of possibly having to intelligently stabilize in the interior of that open book, you can always eventually make this work out. Um, so, um... And the rough idea is 
Okay, so, so this is, is is this in the end like our partial open book? I mean, because our partial open book um, is, is not quite. You can give it the sorted version, right? So you could get you can sorted. certainly interpret it like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a close relation. So you could make things sorted, um, and they you you could make your thing be sorted. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I I'm still uh, asking. Um, so you start with the foliated open book, and then you're saying is you can you can do what you can. Um, so a foliated open book is like a Morse function, right? So let me a see. A circle if I value of Morse function, function, right? Yeah. So suppose you secure a solid torus, right? And you think of it as embedded in R three, right? So, so this I, is kind I, of I, I I I I looked at your paper, so I yeah. understand somewhat. So so you started with something. Now, what's the statement? So this is in principle. I mean, this particular one is actually sorted. No, this no, one it's is not, not because you add and subtract and add add subtract, like add four subtract, times. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, so what do you need to do to get a sorted one? You need to stabilize the open book. In the usual sense of the word, in the interior, you take a, a sum with a positive hop vibration, basically, inside. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you do that, um, you, you're good to go. If you do that just once here, you could arrange it to be sorted. Uh, you might have to be a little careful, again, what moment in time you're starting and ending. And it's just but a little. So are you so you're claiming you're keeping the foliation fixed? Yeah, on absolutely. You're not messing okay. with so anything. Is, with is, okay, I'm I'm gonna talk to you later. This is Let's kind of exactly that. what we do, but keep going. Yeah, it's it's. I think it is. So this folds. Yeah, let's talk later because this is mm -hmm. much longer to describe. But it's it roughly if you do that to get it so called sorted and you do it a bit more sometimes if necessary you get exactly what you are going to want as a partial open book, right? So that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it can get there exactly that way. Um, and maybe for the sake of time, because yeah, we should wrap up. Um, let me just kind of blur a lot of what's happening now. But suppose that you have all that arranged. Now, the idea is that because all your cuts and additions are happening in a non-interfering with each other way, I'm basically trying to um, summarize what's on this slide without actually saying what's happening on this slide. Because you can do that, um, you can take two nearby copies of um, your first page. Um, somehow you know that all the um, cutting arcs, not cutting arcs, but all the arcs for cut cobordisms, they can all be recorded on S0 let me call it S epsilon just to like push it off a little. They can all be recorded on it disjointly. So um, let's just look at them. Let's just keep track of them. I'm going to call these certain beta arcs and don't look at this wrongly color coded picture. And similarly, on that same maybe final surface S2K, which I can think of as S0 after applying my monodromy, I could record disjointly all the arcs that were co-core of addition, co-cores of addition handles. Whatever, you get a bunch of curves that are kind of telling you how the surface is evolving through time. In a sense, you get a bunch of arcs on the union of these two pages that uh, in the bordered floor sense are your parameterizing arcs now for the boundary of the three manifold. And if that sounds totally mysterious, too bad, that's where we're at, but you can get them is the idea. And the rest of the game you play is exactly like uh, you pointed out, Gordana. The rest of the game you play is exactly your typical partial open book story. Um, you take an additional cutting arcs to chop up your page into a polygon-ish. Um, you take enough of those so that only one elliptic point of positive type or whatever, you take their twins, so that things intersect kind of uniquely um, and so on. So you, you follow the familiar recipe, but with some technicalities that give you a Hager, the bordered Hager diagram. Mm -hmm. And through that familiar, but uh, upgraded recipe, you get yourself, again, a special generator, this time on a bordered Hager diagram. 
um, so that it blows up by taking the union. Uh, I, again, this doesn't. Okay. So, so that that special generator respects a very nice gluing formula. Um, and when I'm saying gluing, I'm going to be identifying contact three manifolds so that the foliations, um, as prescribed by the open books, have to match up. Or one is negative, the other, whatever. Um, the local results you expect to see hold. So um, if you take a thickened over twisted disc, um, you get a zero, you get vanishing bordered contact class. If you, um, what's the smallest tight thing you can do? You can take a tight three ball, I guess. Um, you get non-zero stuff like that. Um, and maybe, yeah, this is a good place to stop and we can chat more either now or sometime later about the technical stuff. So thanks for your patience. That's it. Thank you, Ina. Any questions? Um, so I think it's pretty difficult, but the, you take out the binding of an open book, the complement is tight. Can you prove that? If you take I think it's true that if you take the if you take out the binding of an open book decomposition, the complement has not vanishing hater for contact variables. I think this might be a result of Shavelovic and possibly Anir. Can you prove that then? this way? Okay. I don't know, I'm just like, you, like you had some examples. You mean the, which contact invariant are you talking about? Right, I'm trying to catch up with you. Um, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know I these results exactly, but they, they prove that like, the, the complement of the binding of an open book is tight, even if the contact structure is open to the state. Right, so like, the binding has to pass through every, every open twisted disk, you know? Okay. Uh, I don't know. This is like a. It's a, it's a, a potential application. Like, it, can you see? Yeah, it seems like I don't know. It, it, would, it would seem like a natural thing to sort of like a natural like border and ring metal to compute some variance. Uh, never mind. Um. Yeah, I don't see how to fit it geometrically into the setup, but um. Hmm. I mean, if if you take out a, a neighborhood of a knot, then you have, a, like you have natural sutures, either right, either parallel, either, you know, two parallel to the meridian, or you can take two parallels to the boundary, and then you have the sutured invariants in both cases, and I don't know, one of them or the other, you can do some completion and argue that what you get is is tight if you do it in an appropriate way. I mean, there is the, there are several kinds of invariants for the sutured boundary. And uh, I think Etna and Velavik have some sort of an inclusion mm -hmm. to infinity sort of- um, The I limit process. How it was a, the limit procedure. I forget now how the proof exactly goes. Right, but uh, I assume that uh, if you took any suture on the bounding torus, you could you could fit this border picture to it, and then every time you you switch the the slope of the boundary, you can prob you probably understand how you what happens to your picture um, when you add a bypass, and then. Something like that. I, I assume yeah. one can just yeah. dictate what they do. Yeah, you can probably reformulate it. Um, right. Don't know if there's more to say, but um, yeah, I mean, so that's one of the things that we kind of want to um, keep doing is like think of that layering or like what's an elementary little change you can do to the boundary. So, uh, Reformulating this construction to bimodules to like something with 
you're taking the boundary and you're like modifying it by a little bit. You can think of that as a layering, like adding a layer, right? And so you want to like study what's that then, what's the contact invariant in the bi module for a little bypass attachment or something. Like um, so we're in the tinkering phase of a lot of these, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let's thank Ina again. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording for the rest of the